Hi, everybody. Welcome to tonight's program with Coach Benachem Berfeld. Thank you for joining us this beautiful Sunday night. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, again, Shkoyach to people to come on every week, posting it, letting people know about it. And uh, it's a place of Sikh Chaverim. And again, like I say, every week, try to come on if you could. If it's Negea, if it's not Negea, don't come on, but let people know about it. You never know how it can help people in other ways. And Baruch Hashem, the stories and the things that are getting better and better. So just please join us. If anyone wants to join the WhatsApp community, you can WhatsApp me personally at 732-314-1710. I'll send you a link. I'll also post a link here. Menachem will also send the link in the email. For all the people that are watching this on YouTube, you can click on the subscribe button to subscribe to Coach Menachem. You can click on the like button so me and Menachem can make a lot of money. So please do that as soon as possible. Well, thank you. All the advertising sponsors here at Lakewood Scoop and Lakewood, Ellie and Ari for Five Town Central, Chayla Kaufman from JCN. The Jewish Contact Network for always promoting us on all the digital Jewish platforms. If anybody's here the first time, every Sunday night at 9.30 on this Zoom ID, we have different topics, different abonnem, different therapists, very, very engaging topics, things that are negea. So we try to, you know, keep it the flow. Please join us next week. This week we'll have an amazing show, but next week will be even an, another amazing share. We're going to have an amazing program with Rev. David Aaron. He's a famous speaker, author, Marty Stroll. The topic, if you know his books, you'll understand the topic, The Secret Life of God, Transforming Our Perception of the Divine and Rediscovering Your Divine Identity. It's also identity, a little bit tied into this week's program, but David Aaron is very famous. Um, if anybody knows him, read any of his books, he's really next level. So please, uh, tonight is share 202, 201, tonight's 201. Well, it might be 202 with, with, with Tisha Bob, whatever, we're not going to, whatever. It's, it's, it's more than 201, but we're going to call it 201. A keepsake, and we really were going to bring Rabbi Schwartzman, Aaron Schwartzman, on a little bit earlier, but it didn't work with the Gematria, so we had to wait. So now, Baksham, we got the Gematria, so now it's coming on. This is the Gematria. You ready? Here we go. Shalom of Racha, everyone, to Shir, Zoom Shir number 201, Understanding and Healing the Authentic Self. And tonight, Zoom Shir, we'll be discussing how to discover the true you, which leads us up to tonight's Gematria of 201. This is worthwhile to learn. Yeah. Okay, so now that we're here, we're going to first turn to Coach Menachem. Coach Menachem, the famous question every Sunday night. What are we doing here tonight? Sunday night, I'm tired, long day with the kids, first week school. We're here at 9.30. What, what, are, we, what are we trying to accomplish? Well, first of all, we have Ariane. So we're excited. It's always new. So I do want to welcome everyone. Welcome to another Let's Get Real with Coach Menachem. And here we are, Bar Hashem 201. Understanding and healing the authentic self, how attachment and identity shape addiction recovery. And Ari deals with people who are on the journey, addiction, recovery, and he's seen a lot of success. So we're going to talk about it. I know it's not an easy topic, but we got to do it. We live in a world... In a fast-paced world, and we know this, we've been talking about it for a while, it's uh, it's hard to keep up. And, you know, comparing, there's so much going on. And even with all the success that we do have, we don't feel the success because others have more. And I think a lot of it we'll be discussing tonight is really getting to know yourself, um, you know, being happy. And it does boil down to the addiction for those who do have the challenges of addiction. But it's a it's a sensitive topic for those who are on the journey, for those who have relatives that are going through the challenge. But tonight's topic is not only for those who are dealing with addiction. I believe it's many of us, whether it's somebody who you're looking for some meaning in life, so you're not an addict and you're not in recovery, but you feel there's something missing. Some people just can't figure it out. Some people feel a deep sense of loneliness, even with all the friends they have. Other people are on the phone all day. Well, maybe shopping, renovations, vacation. It could be an addiction, but it doesn't have to be. Some people have a hard time connecting with their spouse connecting with their kids, and uh, ultimately connecting with themselves and with Hashem. So, you know, we're talking about addiction, but 
could be many people who don't have quote unquote addiction. It's more meaning to life, understanding who am I, what am I looking for, and getting to that deep place of being okay with myself. And that can be hard. That is a journey, and it's not an easy thing, something to discuss, especially when we talk that we're in El now, getting ready for Rosh Hashanah. There are a lot of people that have fear. They don't know how to. And others are numb. It's just whatever. Been there, done that, another year, it's not for me, no connection. Some feel guilty, some don't. But it really boils down to that spiritual part, which will continue next week in Mitzvah Shem. But I think tonight we will start the conversation together with Ari Schwartzman, somebody who deals with this day in, day out, starting the conversation of what are we looking for? What's that identity? How do we pinpoint? How do I know if I have it or not? You know, to understand better. And if I don't, if I'm on the journey, if I'm struggling, what? how do I get there? What, you know, where do I start? So let's start the conversation. Mimetz Hashem. Ari, it's very, uh, you know, it's an honor to have you here with us. And I know it's not going to be easy for everyone. These ideas are, whether it's new or some people tried and it didn't work. You know, take a deep breath. Let's listen. Let's see if you have any questions. Bring them up and let's see if we can work it out. And Mitzvah Shem, we shall have Siyat Adeshmaya. Thank you. Coach Menachem, beautiful opening. Yeah, tonight's going to be an interesting topic. It's actually in all the I don't think we ever took this angle, but hopefully it'll be uh, something different and we'll uh, really dive into it. I feel like there's two parts there's the identity part and the addiction part and see how it ties in. But I would like to first start with the identity part, Aaron, if that's okay. His name is Aaron Schwartzman, but I'm going to call him Ari because that's how I know him. So we'll stick with that, and I'm going to start now. Here we go. We've titled it Understanding and Healing the Authentic Self, How Attachment and Identity Shape Addiction Recovery. Aaron's bio. Aaron Schwartzman is a licensed mental health counselor, LMHC, in Boca Raton, Florida, dedicated to helping individuals overcome addiction, trauma, and identity struggles. Grounded in the Jewish values and beliefs, Aaron inter integrates spiritual and therapeutic approaches to guide clients towards lasting transformation. He specializes in working in Jewish adult men, offering a unique blend of traditional therapy and innovation in innovative techniques, including attachment, focused, and re reduction model. While Aaron occasionally incorporates psychedelic therapy as a supplement tool, his primary focus is on helping clients rediscover their authentic selves and create meaningful, fulfilling lives. As a devoted husband and father of five, Ari also balances his professional work with strong commitments to his family and his community. Aaron, Ari, it's a pleasure to have you here. Yes, somebody's clapping for you. Your mother probably. Yes, great. And let's see if everybody else will clap for you. The floor is yours. For the beautiful introduction and bring me on your show, Menachem. I really appreciate it. So it's important before we go into addiction and understanding how mental health plays a role into this, to give you a little background how the emotions evolve over time and really the basic format of how emotions come about. In order to understand this, we would have to start when someone is born. When a child is born, we have two types of experiences. We have a biological and a spiritual disposition. Those experiences come out, and a child looking here pops up into the world, and he's sort of lost. I know he doesn't have the much shovel to realize he's lost, but he's like, huh, looking around, seeing dark, should don't really see. First thing he experiences is mother. What's mother doing? Embracing the child. When they embrace the child, they're creating this attachment in a perfect situation, a connection a secure attachment. And within the first four to six years, we, we see these different values or attachments that the child forms, which cluster together and create sort of a safe world that he's navigating. We call value structures. Within the first six years, once they formulate these structures, it starts leading into the next stage of the development we call core belief. Once I know I'm secure and I have values that will help me really navigate this world, I start really, start, start really what does it mean myself within these value structures? We call core, core beliefs. Through these core beliefs, they start realizing that they're they're lovable, they're, they're, they're acceptable. They start realizing that they get to have this form of existence. For the next six to eight, six years, about give or take between 10 and 13, these core belief structures formulate together similar to the values that you had, and they're built on value structures. Those core belief structures, because they're built on values and core beliefs, lead to some identifiers because I'm valued. And I believe in this, therefore I identify as this. Depending on your upbringing and sociocultural environments, those identifiers could be yeshivish, it could be modern orthodox, it could be I'm a learner, I'm a sports player, so on and so forth. Some of those you just try out for fun. 
to figure out who you are, some of those will actually become part of who you are. And for the next 10 or so years, give or take between the age of 20, some people to 30, you start developing identifiers, which become your really your identity development. Within that identity development, you start finding marriage partners, job, depending on who you are, you'll have different identifiers. However, what if things malfunction? There's two main types of groups of malfunctions that can happen during the earlier stages of life. One is called trauma, which comes from typically three forms of abuse, physical, emotional, sexual abuse. And the other one would be neglect. Neglect is way more common. And at least from my experience, many times, not downplaying trauma, neglect could be more subtle and harder to heal because it's not what happens to you, like what happens in trauma. Neglect is what doesn't happen to you that you might have needed and you missed the boat. So if just for a simple example where neglect would come in, which most of us can relate to, would be a father working a nine-to-five job or nine-to-eight job, depending on the, the, the amount of income they need. And they're not that they're a bad individual. They're an awesome individual. They're supplying for the wife, supplying for the children. They're trying really, really hard to make a living. Wife has already had seven kids in the house. She's just worrying about the dinners, even just putting food on the plates. Father comes home 7 o'clock, 7.30 at night. Got a daughter gives two or three minutes per kid if he even has the time to do that. Wants to run to Seder a little bit. By the time he comes home, he's tired. It's 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. He missed the kids at bedtime. This goes on for 10 years. This, he's not a bad dad. He just neglects his kids' needs because he has no other choice. That child during the age of 6 to 10 is going to conclude, I don't have a value necessarily or a belief in myself because he's invisible. Not necessarily because the parents meant to. That structure could start making him say, hey, hold on, let me do something outside of myself to get this attention, to get this need. Because if I don't, I'm not securely attached. Like we spoke about in the beginning, when kids are little, usually, most of the time, with rare cases, they're going to have some type of a, a, of a secure attachment or some type of security because they're cute, they're loving, and they would die without intervention. Unlike animals in the earlier stages, they did this pop and they, they do their own thing. Human beings need touch and connection. So what ends up happening is, is that they don't have a core belief. They don't have this belief. So they look at outsiders and start getting beliefs. They start making trouble, being funny. Different experiences they'll do to fill that void of belief within themselves. When that ends up happening, they start hitting identity. Instead of having an internal identity called an identity, many times they have a you identity is the term I use. An outside in identity, which is the opening for you name it. Drug addiction, food addiction, any form of outside in expression I see even emotional attention uh, addictions that many people come in. Like, I, for example, going to shul, where what everyone's going to see or say, well, I'm wearing the right shirt, I'm wearing the right shoes. Just having this extra social anxiousness, we go hypervigilant or awareness because you've been opened up in a younger age to make sure that you have to feel safe. But as an older person, that safety might not be safe anymore. That could turn to social anxiety, self consciousness, insecurities, only because the primary years of, of of your experience. In order to appreciate that there's really four parts of this identity that formulate over time, which play a huge role within the identity. Identity is made up of what you do, think, and feel. And two other parts, which are two sides of the same coin, is your beliefs and values. And many times, because of the lack of security we have in ourselves, although we value certain things because we didn't believe in ourselves, we didn't necessarily value the belief systems. Or if we don't value the belief systems and we act upon them anyways, we have a problem here. We have a fragmentation within our identity because now we're doing things we don't necessarily value even if we believe in them. In other words, we're now relying on our internal emotional experiences. There starts the extra level of disassociation. This leads me to the, the points of where i like to focus on today. And after we do this, we'd love to take some questions. The first point is when you when you try to work with addiction, it's primary to really focus not on the, on the addiction, but on the attachment and safety that might have caused you to need to numb and block out the uncomfortability or maintain the disconnection to yourself, which was already reinforced in the beginning stages of your life. So addiction is really, really met. It really is it re wired in unmet needs and safety attachments. True healing only really happens when they are, they're able to have that safety net and really re understand what's my value, my needs and work through it. Interestingly is that based on the Jewish concepts, we should be chayv, scar, and onish from zero if that's the whole purpose of a life. But yet, until 13, they don't even get a single out of error for anything because it's really trial and error. It's about exploring who you really are and how to work through it. So much so that at 20 years old, you see, you get a free big according to Midrashim as well. In other words, it's not about right or wrong. It's about self-exploration and really figuring out who you are through the Torah lens. 
It's about self-awareness, self-awareness and self-acceptance and really understanding who you are, which is why it leads me to the second point. It's very important. Although diagnosing and symptom management is very important when it comes to mental health and psychology, when it comes to security and safety, not always does it do what we want it to do. Diagnosing sort of is another form of insecure attachment because now you're making the person feel uncomfortable with themselves, which may not be the case. They just feel very uncomfortable, and now they have a history of externalizing their identity, which is why they have all these symptoms. Healing from within helps resolve many of these symptoms, and by default, this diagnostic or the symptomology will dissipate by, by default over time when they have that internal healing. And another thing is important to point out, the third point is that many, many times, these don't evolve overnight. There are exceptions to the rule, but typically, most of the experience we have in life takes time to develop. It's the reinforcement of those. Six, seven, eight, 12. It takes years to develop, especially the addiction. So to expect addiction to stop overnight, you're going to have limitations. So it's important to know just as it developed over time, it will take time to heal. However, as long as you have the right markers and ability to navigate and measure success, you'll be able to give that reinforcement. We need that self-identity within the exchange and experience to give the person the space to heal and accept the changing process. The last thing is, I know they put it out there, that I, sometimes I will work with psychedelics versus psychiatry. And it's important to understand the difference between the two as well and when appropriate, when psychedelics can be used which versus psychi psychi psychiatry. And this is something we'll go into more with the questions later on. Psychedelics versus psychiatry. Psychiatry is dealing with the, the symptomology again. The reason why they're doing it is because the person can't function again. They're depressed or anxious and they're already just depleted emotionally. So psychiatry works to numb the pain with the hopes that people will change the behaviors. However, it's a catch-22. By numbing the pain, you take away the capacity to motivate yourself to figure out what to change and where to change. So many times people do take these medications, and yes, they feel great. They feel really awesome. The problems stay in place. The lack of identity stays in place. The connection to thyself stays in place. When used properly, psychedelics promote something called ego dissolution. The eye of you is diminished. So just to clarify what that really means, there's something called anxiety and depression. Depression is when a past experience dominated in the here and now, and I can't be in my system. Anxiety is when the future dominates in the here and now, and I can't be in the system. In other words, we're not in the here and now. We're there we're while being in the here and now, that doesn't work. The question is, what part of your system makes you do that? It's the egocentric, the eye of you brings that experience here. Through psychedelic use, again, in the proper setting for the right proper individual, it breaks down that part of you. And now you get to see those events for what they really are, putting a wedge in them. Over time, you're able to do something called integration and ha have those changes work through within your real life and have the safety that you formulated during that experience to make the changes you need. And over time, a lot of the symptoms itself dissipate just like in the other experience I explained earlier. Now, this is the basic intro that I, I would like to give, and I'm going to wait to hear some more questions, and we'll explore it through the questions that I brought about. Let's start the polls, okay? Everybody, let's answer the polls, and then we'll go back into the idea. Three questions. Which of these do you think plays a bigger role in overcoming addiction? And these four options. When somebody has an addiction, what's, what do you think plays the biggest role? Supportive relationships. Develop in, developing independence and self-reliance, professional help, or I'm not sure. Second, we're not going to see people. Okay. Number two, how do you believe your childhood relationships affect your coping mechanisms? I was speaking that a little bit in the opening. So three answers. A, they play a major role in your coping mechanism, including addiction. B, they somewhat influence my coping, or D, they have little to zero influence. Okay, this is an interesting question. Third question. I want to see if anybody answers this one. What does my identity look like and what role does it play in my life? Five options, four options. Number one, my identity is shaped by my values and beliefs, and it provides a foundation for my decisions. Number two, my identity is a reflection of my social roles. It guides how I interact with others. Number three, my identity is fluid and consistently evolving. It adapts to new experiences and growth. 
So number one is basically the values are shaped by your values and beliefs, and that what gives you your foundation to make a decision, good or bad, whatever that is. The second one is similar, but different. It's a reflection of social values, so it's more like socially learned and how I interact with others. The third option is my, my identity is constantly changing. It adapts to new experiences of growth. As you keep on going through different situations, that's how you're changing. And option number four, my identity is rooted in my past and upbringing. It shapes my sense of self-being. So it goes back to you, really your childhood, you know, the first few years as Aaron was talking about. So those are the three options. Aaron, you want to unmute? Let's hear you now. I'm here. Oh, 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 much better. Okay, okay, let's do the polls. And then if you don't, let's let's do a re synopsis of the opening, if that's okay with you. Can we do that? We can do that. Okay. So let's go through the polls. Everybody's answering them now. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to repeat them. Number one, which of these do you think plays? Which of these do you think plays a bigger role in overcoming addiction? Forty-nine percent of people said supportive relationships. Ninety percent of people said developing independence and self-reliance. Twenty-five percent of people said professional help, and nine percent I'm unsure. So most people, fifty percent of people here, believe supportive relationships is the biggest role in overcoming addiction. Aaron, do you want to comment on anything on this? So it's very interesting. I, I purposely wrote these out when we, we were discussing this because none of them are, are a definitive answer. They all play a certain aspect of of change. And here specifically, you see that uh, very much. So there's, there's a whole theory in psychology that whether uh, individual therapy helps relationships, specifically marriages or really family relationships, or it hurts it. And many times, due to the self-healing, especially in marriages, individual therapy can actually create a divorce and create people to separate. And the reason why is because you marry someone to counterbalance your insecurities and pains throughout your life. So when you go to individual therapy, working through your own childhood wounds, especially in a relationship, many times you'll come back to the relationship and no longer will that shape fit together because now you're reshaped. So although, yes, in the, it's primary to develop independence and self-reliance, we live in an attached world. There's an idea that we have two primary roles in our, our functioning, both authenticity and attachment, which touches back upon what we sort of the intro was about. Uh, authenticity is the ability to understand my inner belt of experience and my emotions, my feelings, everything from inside. Attachment is the outside world and how I connect to the outside world. Since in our younger years of life, we have a connection to the outside world, which is dominant. Over time, we end up losing our inner world connected inside. And over time, what ends up happening is we lose our ability to regulate and connect. The only option as we get older and we lose this, this association to inside world is by continuing this pattern by using something or some way to distract or shut down our inner world. Drugs is a big factor or other addictive behaviors. So the only way to really heal that would be only individual therapy. It's actually applied. We're not going to start off. Okay, so here's a question that came in. My husband has been in addiction treatment in and out now for a while. Things have get, you know, got better, but we don't see the end of the tunnel. It's It sounds like it's really hard, the process. And again, she mentioned in and out. The question is why? And what are some ideas that they can do, look out for, to help the situation? So that's a, it's a, val, a val, very, very good question. I hear this very often. Hey, my, my, my husband, my, my, my wife, uh, someone's been going in and out of the system and we're not getting the results we want. What's going on? So like we said originally, there's uh, many times people are going to these uh, to facilities which are meaningful facilities to help an individual. However, because of certain uh, factors in play, they don't always necessarily get to get to the core of the individual. Uh, they, like we were saying earlier that the foundation of, of the ability to counterbalance an addiction isn't symptom management. Yes, it's important to stop the actual addiction and to balance out the symptoms. However, that is that is missing the core. The core is understanding who they are. The reason why the person is using sub substances typically is because they don't feel comfortable in their skin. And the reason why they don't feel comfortable in the skin is because they don't really know who they are. And they never necessarily had the safety to explore that. There's a concept in the Torah is that instead of many times, parents or others in the system use control or guilt and what causes individuals to shut down their ability to explore. It's interesting that until the age of 13, 
There's no chiv for any averos. It's meant to be an exploration process. In other words, it's not about perfection. It's about exploration. But due to certain factors and inability to understand how to kind of balance children, we end up using certain limitations. And in, in adulthood, they lack that understanding. So going back to the question, is it in the first stage, you're really helping the individual understand what they are using for. Not that they're using and, and, and shaming them, but giving them the safety to understand what the use of the drug is and what is the point of the drug. There are three stages to changing a behavior. The first stage is to realize that it's not linear. Nothing in life happens overnight. And it's very frustrating when our children don't succeed when we tell them to do things. So we try to get them to succeed faster and faster. But in adulthood, many times we take on these same experiences and we don't realize that we're on the same cycle. There's something called, I don't know if you guys know the story of the dancing beer. It's, it's, it's a famous story. I think Chabad talks about the dancing beer. There's a story about this dancing beer in the 1600s or so. The Cossacks used to go, go, go around to tell. Books, there's books about the Rebbe. There's a whole story about the, the, the Yeah, band. the story with the Rebbe teaching. Paul Zayda. Zayda. There's Paul Zayda. Zayda. Paul Zayda. Yeah, so the, the underpinnings of the story is that a lot of Ukrainians, they used to they used to go around, they, they murdered these two called Dabras in the towns. And at the end of the night, they were bored. And so what they do, they set up these makeshift cages, like a UFC cage. And they put this cage flooring on and they burnt this really hot coals on the bottom. And they used to play music and get shaker and dance and laugh. And it used to be really fun for them. After months of doing this, they were able to eventually remove the coals under from the feet. And they were able to play the music. Because of pure cane and association with the music, they were able actually got the beers to jump by default without having burning coals there. So imagine we take a time warp and we went there and watched the same scene going down. I asked, they said, hey, look at those beers. They're jumping out of joy. They're happy. Look at their jump, jumping to the music. No one would believe that. They'll know. No, no. They're jumping because of pain. This, from the naked eye now, it looks that way. But really, it's the history of pain and the coals that allow them to jump. Many people who are using their addictions, although it looks as if they're just using drugs, most of them are in deep-seated pain. And there are different triggering events that cause them to have that stimulus effect. So yes, the drug helps them. But ultimately, the drug itself isn't taking away from the pain, which is why over time, they have to up the drug use. So we send them to these type of programs that treat symptoms and get them to sort of stop using drugs and succeed. And sometimes they do some clinical work, which is pretty okay. They don't necessarily allow them to work through their core structures of pain and heal relationally and within themselves. So which is why six months, a year, or two years later, they'll be back at square one or more or less square one and repeat the cycle. They're not really dealing with the authentic self. And it's really hard to deal with that authentic self in a program in two, three, four, six months. The question is really how to implement it. You know, I'm not here to fix the world, but all these addiction treatments, what is it that they need to go down to that core identity to be able to heal? Yeah. So there's a few different approaches. Uh, the, 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 one of the key approaches to realize that change isn't linear. The first step to change is to realize that, hey, it's one step forward, six steps back. The issue is, is the safety of learning how to work through those step backs and understand what's happening on in the moment that allow you to change. The problem is the second rule of change. Because it's uncomfortable and because there are other stuff that are happening, whether it's a parent, a husband, a father, and now they have other, other things that are happening, they avoid that pain. So they say it's not worth it so hard, which leads to a, a discomfort, which is the third stage. In other words, when you want to change, you have to always realize that there's three things that's going to happen. The first thing that happen is it's not going to change right away. So therefore, just like it took time to develop your addiction, it's, it's not going to necessarily change overnight. The second thing is you're going to avoid it because you're not succeeding right away. You avoid dealing with addiction with the deep core un uncomfortabilities, which leads to the third part is that change is uncomfortable. So understanding that change is uncomfortable and normalize that, uh, normalizing that uncomfortability and getting more aware of that experience in the moment, you're able to work within that pain, understand what that pain is, and over time heal it through relational healing. But going through the past trauma events solely from the past, you can never take away past. You can't undo pain from the past. You can only heal pain in the here and now, which is why many times by shutting down through medications, you do take away from symptoms. But ultimately, you're exasperating the pain longer term because the healing is not going to be able to take place. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to a live question, okay? Don't worry, it's good. Hi. How are you? Hi, hello. I'm asking you the question. 
You're asking uh, Mr. Schwartzman. Oh, I don't have him here. Okay. Um, okay, so I actually have two questions, but my first question is like this. So I'm in years already um, in therapy, and I like to know if um, I don't have yet a secure attachment um, with anyone, which I really feel secure. And my question is if I could be in peace, if I could even have this goal of being in peace with myself, self-attachment. Do you understand that question? I'm not so I'm not understanding. Can you create peace? I, 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 I'm, I, I want. Uh, I feel that I'm, I'm connected already to myself. Now I, I'm seeking for attachment, secure attachment. My question is if I could uh, work on self-attachment, if that is already attachment. doesn't have attachment from others, but she's getting to a place yeah. where she has a healthy attachment with herself. Is that okay? And so that, that can't work, but ultimately we, we need, going back to two primary ingredients, we live in an attached world. Unlike animals who, when they're born, they literally can take care of themselves. Human beings without touch and connection will die. So although as an adult, you don't necessarily need that same nurturing, but to a certain extent without the attachment, you're going to be missing links. So yes, ultimately you could you could feel better within your own. Okay, so, so technically I I do have like most people, but this the real secure one, the safe attachment, which which we all yearn for. Um, till I get it, I I do want to feel. I I want to hear from a therapist that it's you, you can live through without without a very um close attachment because I I yearn for it and I don't have it and. I I kind of feel that I can't do anything. What can I do? I can't push I can't push it, right? Yep, yep. So I there can't. there are ways so there's intimate connections and there's also relational connections. What you're touching upon is hey, I'm in a stage in my life right now for whatever certain factors, the intimate connection may not be one I'd be able to foster. But yes, that's right. It's a, it's important to have any healthy attachment, secure attachment that you feel you're able to be yourself and that authentic self that you are feeling and finding. Through relationships, intimacy will be one version of it, but there are a lot of other connections that you can have that secure attachment and have that. Even clinically, that could be healing for you as well with a therapist. Uh -huh. And how about um, an addiction? Do do I need to work on addiction that is not harmful or it doesn't affect anyone? Um, is it okay till the 120 to be to stay with it? I, I'm not understanding the question. Okay, so let's say an addiction of pinching, picking your your pimples. Yeah. Okay, type of. Um, is that okay? Um, do I need to work on it if if it doesn't affect anyone? That's about myself? something that's not that's not like you know the, the famous question: What's an addiction? Addiction is something that deters your functionality in life. If it's not deterring your functionality in life, and you like being picking your pimples or twitching your hand, uh, then uh, you know. Something that, no, that... it bothers me. It, it bothers me that that I I need to do it on Shabbos, but some I I don't feel it's some I I can't stop it, but it's not that I affect my husband and kids or anyone else. So I wonder if I should work so hard to stop it. It's, it's all relative to what like 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 as she was saying. And really, addiction is really that's causing something that you can't function or, or or focus in your life and be healthy. If it's something that's really causing uncomfortability because of your, your religious standards and it's against Shabbos halacha, and now it's really creating really uncomfortability that you're not functioning emotionally and you have no patience and irritable around your children. It's something to talk about, figure out ways maybe to cope through that experience. But again, if it's something that's not really creating a dysfunction in your life, there'll be no reason to necessarily get rid of that. We all have unhealthy mm -hmm. habits. The difference between an unhealthy habit and an addiction is really what, what she was saying is that it's causing you to malfunction, not be able to function in your personal life. Oh, okay. And as mm -hmm. a therapist, do you have ideas for her that she should be able to heal her, you know, the <laughs> habit? Her habits? It's really depending where it's coming from. It's hard to answer the regular achas exactly. How no, do you... no, just the idea, just the idea that you what, what you've seen and yes, you. It's something to, you can work on, but the patient's not ready to do the real hard work. It's really depending on, again, that goes back to whether it's malfunctioning. The basis of cha behavioral change, let's say, let's we use, we were Rosh Hashanah, we'll use Teshuva. Teshuva has a three-part equation, right? So awareness, and the charat, which is uncomfortability, and then it's being in the same situation and controlling yourself. If there's 
if you're aware that it's happening and there's no enough uncomfortability for wanting to change because you're okay with with it's happening, you're not going to be in the same scenario and updating the script. So that's mm. a good question in a religious in a religious place. If somebody doesn't feel the uncomfortability doing the sin or whatever, doing the wrong, so then well, you're not going to be able to do the change. Yeah, again, yeah. here it's not a wrong or right necessarily because it could be how logically it's fine. Yeah. What I'm using is really in a clinical standpoint is that when you have that awareness and there's no necessarily uncomfortability enough to motivate change in the third scenario, being really figuring out ways to update it, no clinical intervention will ever work for anyone. Uh, uh, one, one second, Mrs. Let, let, me, let me ask the next question. I think it's going to tie in a little bit, okay? My therapist mentioned that a goal of treatment is so I become comfortable in my own skin. I'm having a hard time understanding that concept. I believe I'm comfortable in my own skin, but I want to enjoy life and drink. Is that possible? So is this person is, okay, first of all, great question. That's an awesome question. Let's to clarify. Is this the person who's an addict and now he doesn't want to drink or we can't drink because he's been sober for a long time? Or is it just saying, hey? I, let's, again, the question is written. Somebody sent it in. Let's assume the person was an addict and now, you know, they, they're, they're over that. They, they've been clean for a long time. And now they're trying to become comfortable in their own skin. They want to enjoy life. They want to, you know, not be like rigid with everything. So how does that balance out? Is, is it possible to, let's take it from the, from the addict point of view. We could take it not, you know what I mean? So I, I, when, when, what I've noticed is that there's, there's two models when it comes to working through someone's addiction. There's something called the abstinence model and the reductionist model. Depending on the individual and what they've gone through, it's a tricky answer because Although there is a reductionist approach to people who have used substances and now they're working through them and they're able to maybe use a reductionist approach, meaning still be able to use substances after they had some time of clean, but the individual doesn't have the right frameworks. Many times that one drink can't throw them off. Uh, with, the right, with the right container and the right overview, there are many, many people who can't use substances post sobriety, yes. Uh, one one version I've noticed with my clients that I work with specifically when it comes to their um their working through their inner inner childhood wounds and after some time of sobriety they're able to drink by the kiddishes and change their life because the drinking was never the problem the problem was their attachment and comfortability and once they got to know themselves and work through their inner child pains through relational healing in the here and now through relationships friendships or the things they call their triggers and they're no longer being held back or held captive by them. The alcohol doesn't become as fulfilling for them because it's not there to black out. It's actually there to open up. So when they're by a kiddush club and they're having a chayim, they're connecting socially. They're not disconnecting through the drink because that's social anxiety. On the contrary, they're using the alcohol there or their drink to, like you were saying, chill and having a good time. So it's tricky when you're mentioning, you know, people are on the journey of healing and they've been clean for a while and the idea is that if you take one drink, you you fall back, you fall behind. And over here, you're saying, wait a second, it's possible. So there might be people out there saying, you know, maybe I'm uh, comfortable in my skin already. I can start drinking. Let's make a little time to that. Yeah. So there, there, it happens to be very true. The problem is that many people have been um, socialized to a model that had a lot of truth to it historically. But today, we're looking through the lenses of the evolution of addiction, which has been brought out from the last 50, 60 years, you look at that, not necessarily is one addict the same addict. We have we have the ability to differentiate between how things work. So there are many people who have this perspective that I'm still an addict, but they're not an addict. And they sort of have the Stockholm Central fear of what can be, especially now with this renaissance of psychedelics and people learning how the transformational experience really works. And they're able to have this newfound identity and create this connection of safety to themselves. It's true, a lot of their addicts aren't really addicts, they're identity problems. And when they no longer have their problem of identity, but they're still living in old scripts of their life, they're sort of stuck in who they aren't, even though they're functioning here and now. So actually, they're stuck at, I would say, limbo. So it makes sense. And there's a lot, of, I see a lot of individuals, most of my private practices I work with are people such as that, who are stuck in the old versions of scripts in the here and now in a new script of who they are, not necessarily hitting the update. How many of people, hopefully none of you have smartphones, but if you happen to have a smartphone and you notice in the app store, it says the little bubble and says, hit update, hit update. How often do you actually hit update? And I know I still have 77 new apps I haven't hit update to. Sort of in the same ways, it's, it's the same pattern. It's when people had an intervention that's outdated for who they really are today and they don't hit update, they will live in old scripts and they will feel the discomfortability in their body, even when, like this woman earlier was asking, when they feel comfortable in their skin, but they're not necessarily comfortable in their life because their skin is not updated to the life they want to live. I want to go back a little bit, okay? Like, I know we're jumping into the addiction. I want to go back to the identity part. Aaron, is that okay? 
hundred percent. So it's like the beginning of the program. I just want to understand when we say identity, what what does that mean? What is it form from? One of the questions in the polls that we didn't really get to. What does identity mean, and where does it really form? And and what does it what does it mean? What does it do for us? So I identify as a from yid that goes to shul. What does that mean for me? Okay, that's a good. That's a great, 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 great question. So we'll we'll we'll, we'll tell you that a guy says he's a, he identifies as a from yid. He goes to shul and he values and believes it, and he does things and feels it. So just to, before we even answer, it, it's all to understand what identity is. Identity is an accumulation of really four factors: what you do, what you think, and what you feel. However, there are two other parts. There are two sides of the same coin: your value and belief structures. What you value and belief plays a huge role in your feelings, thoughts, and actions. So many times I wake up in the morning, I don't want to dive in. I already woke up late. I drove the kids to the carpool. I got my clients starting a little bit. I'm like, ah, I go to that right now? No, but I believe in it. I, I, these days, I definitely value it. My body's telling me, Ari, you want to do this right now, 40-minute davening? Let's do a 10-minute davening. In other words, now, right now, I have, a, I have a problem. I have this need based on my value and beliefs, but my body's telling me otherwise. How do I make sense within that? So depending on the individual, a lot of times you don't make sense. I want to pause because I think this is a very, like, I really want to hone in on this point. Like, I feel like this is one of the most, the million dollar question that people always run into this problem is like, we know we shouldn't steal, but then we do things that are questionable. I know that I should daven, but I, but I, I missed, or I didn't put on tefillin or I didn't go to shul. I know I shouldn't speak Lashonara, but I'm sitting in shul. I know I'm speaking Lashonara, but so how does that, that's what I really want to get at. Like, what? We have the identity. We know our beliefs. We're brought up a certain way. I'm talking about the people that are healthy. I'm not going into the not healthy, but we could do that later. But for the people that are brought up in the regular system, and we always say, oh, I don't get it. How could the guy do that? Like, we don't get it. So how does that play out? Explain to me, like, why would somebody who's brought up a certain way, who knows right and wrong and has values, and he knows it, but yet he loses that power of identity? So that, so what ends up happening is many of us, right? Many of us, like we were saying earlier in the program, we not necessarily internalize belief systems or factors that might have gotten us in certain places. So we take on these belief structures without necessarily internalizing them. So we don't really value them, even though we do them. Tefillah is a good one. Many, many, many people don't necessarily value Tefillah, even though they believe in it and they know the power of it. So then now if they don't value their belief systems, they can have a harder time following through. So now they have chakras to daven or they have any other value belief thing that the way they were brought up is that the way i view it is that some people just don't connect via davening it just doesn't talk to them some people connect via chesed some people so it's not like that's where you know that's why i'm really getting you know again so then that goes back to values and beliefs in other words it's not that they they, they have a value structure they believe in tefillah but they're going to put their energies into another thing and that's a value to and belief so if they could internalize what they have and make it their own They'll be okay with it. The problem is when they take on other people's values, they don't have the identity, they have the identity, they don't have the capacity to do that. So what ends up happening is they end up having a rupture within their identity because they're believing in something they don't necessarily value because they like chesed, like we were saying. But yet they were socialized or guilted or, or controlled to value tefillah 90% versus, and that goes back to chinuch because we don't have a 20, 20, 20 breakdown. It could be 90 breakdown chesed, 10% davening, and yeah, that would be fine as well, which is why the key to this experience isn't religion, it's identity through the religion, which is that there's a saying in the Torah, b'shvili nivra olam. B'shvili means I have to figure out what's my tachos in life, not what the external tachos of religion is. It's my internal belief system within the religional frameworks, religion, if it's a word even, frameworks of where I manifest myself. Because otherwise, we're going to be doing rope behavior or robotic behavior. And what ends up happening is I give up on my authentic self because what I am do, think, and feel isn't necessarily what I believe in. It's what you believe in. And it's your balance for your religion, which happens to be Judaism that I believe in. But like you said, I don't have to do an 80% Shemona X-ray tefillah. I could do a 10% tefillah, do a 60% chesed, and do a 25% focus on my family. And that's my balance of religion. And I'm not breaking anything halachically. I can be just as much of a good Jew, which is why the basis of religion is identity. So this, this this really takes us to those uh, real deep, dark questions that we have to ask ourselves and start all over again. I mean, we many people, many of us, you know, grew up a certain way, doing everything right. And now you're stopping and you wait a second, I'm going to question, why am I davening? Why am I learning? What's my belief? And then he might not know where to go. What are my answers? I don't know. And uh, 
And just by saying, I don't connect to davening, how do I know if it's real or it's just, I don't know what davening is all about, or I don't have that attachment and uh, I'm not interested because it doesn't talk to me. It's something to really, you know, ponder, something to takes time. Which is why the basis of really functional b- balance is really figure out who I am. And it's interesting the structure of the religion that we follow, Judaism. It will seem logical that Hashem should make us required to do mitzvahs from the age zero and hold us accountable. I mean, that will just make logical sense to say, hey guys, this is what you got to do. You get accountability. At the age of zero, you get schar initiatives. But it's not the case. It's 13. And not even that interestingly, at the age of 20, Hashem gives us a freebie. There's no from 13 to 20, yes, it's high, uh, mitzvah, onish, but at 20 years old, we know according to this farm that we get a freebie. What's that mean? Meaning, perfection isn't goal, it's identity. It's figuring out who we are within the world of give and take to be able to figure out what that flow is of my own doing within this world of mitzvahs. Because there's no factual that I have to do 70%, 60% of each one, it's how I relate to it. But when I'm pulled outside, it's, it's not a chinuch process, it's a control process. We lose a sense of who we are. And then what I do think and feel are losses in the shuffle. And the only way for me to function in that type of world is by numbing myself. How I numb myself could be a million different ways. When many times when I walk into yeshiva and I see a kid who's 13 to 14, dominating a 35 minish on estrogen, he has an OCD problem. That's not spiritually healthy for a 13-year-old to dominate that. Why is it we can analyze that? But that necessarily is spiritually holy when you see a 13-year-old dominating two hours from an estrogen. It's learning how to understand what it means who he is. And many times that person has very big imbalances within their emotions because they lost the sense of identity. I want to get into the identity. There's a lot of questions in identity itself. Um, let's just let's go to the next question though. Hold on one second. Hi. Oh, hi. I'm just um wondering just sort of to add on what you're saying, you know. Um, you know, you can have the proverbial addictive personality where somebody will maybe transfer that kind of craving into something something so you talk about religion i've seen and i was just as guilty of it myself the people obsessed with the you know it, it becomes an obsession not just an addiction uh with you know I, I can say they're escaping the religion but they you know it becomes you know uh, you know this craving I, I don't know for perfection power control a number of factors I mean, I'm, do you ever do you, you know? I know you want to probably guide people spiritually, but do you see that in your? Do you come across that in your practice? These ones you think this, yeah, you know, the ones that will spend two hours davening or something, but they, you know, they've got to get it exactly right, or they want you to be on their level. You know, I've I've seen that. You know, I, I, I went through a stage I was pretty obnoxious, so I was just saying, do you encounter that a lot, or I, I don't know, you would. I don't know if you would deal a healthy or non-healthy approach to, you know, or, uh, discipline, maybe, you know. That's a great, it's a great point. Meaning just because a spiritual a behavior is spiritually holy doesn't mean yeah. it's, doesn't mean it's healthy. A hundred percent. I've seen many people using, and it goes back to secure attachment. When a person doesn't have an yeah. internal connection to themselves, they're using sometimes outside means for internal mm-hmm. things. And it could be religion as well. It's interesting that when you come to tefillah, the foundation of tefillah is kavana. Kavana is an internal experience, mm-hmm. an external mm-hmm. experience. And additionally, you see it's a avodah shabalev, not an external behavior. It's about balance internally. That's what tefillah is. So really going back to authentic, authentic self, this ability to really connect to yourself while doing that external means tefillah, davening, whatever those words are, the shakling, whatever you want to call it, but with an internal connection. Otherwise, it's like avodah zara. Yeah, I was th- I was thinking about that about us, or you know, I, I I guess it's trying to find a balance where you might, you know, the, with the Yiddish kite to the Torah, it's my life, but are you, you know, at some point sacrificing it for something that's really not healthy, or you know, I I, I know it's a subjective question, you know, some, you know, but but I, yes, I, sir. Oh, I can't hear you. Hashem gave us three tefillas a day, right? Hashem gave us three. yeah, Hashem mm-hmm. gave us forty. He could have given us on the hour, every hour, you should be saying a tefillah. I mean, that, that can also work, but yet he picks times, and not even that, he says, there's man I mean, there's only time, and, and don't praise, I mean, nowadays it's very iffy, right? We mm-hmm. got, but the facts are, Hashem gave structures to how to do that, because, yeah, he maybe could see, hey, this guy knows that I'm the, I'm the creator, and yeah. he wants to connect me, Hashem, all the time. But there's ways, mm-hmm. structures, how to do that connection. Otherwise, 
it's not going to become a secure connection anymore. It's going to be an obsession. Yeah, that's true. And imagine he's serving himself. But yeah, well, it's really yeah, the ego, yeah, it really I, does spoil down to right. that. Unhealthy. I, I think we should I think we should back up and for those who didn't have the healthy attachments. And yeah. what can we do practical, you know, to That's start today? I want to start fresh. What are my values? What you know, what I'm not sure what we're looking for. What are we looking for to find that identity? It's an amazing question. So that's that's a million dollar question. So before I want to go into the cool concept here, before and I'll jump into that answer, hey guys. And this is for, let's say Ushi and uh, and Coach Menachem. You guys can respond. Let's do this together, and we'll bring everyone in by default, right? If you guys yeah. have a, your voice recording. I mean, you guys, I, you guys don't have smartphones, but if you happen to have a smartphone, you have WhatsApp and you your voice recording. You ever listen to your voice recording? Yeah. Hey, do you like the way you sound? No. Every person in the world that listens to their voice for some reason. Hates the way they sound. I think even Steve Young, everybody. I was going to ask you a question. You, you, Ushi, you listen to Coach Menachem. Uh, Coach Menachem, you listen to Ushi, right? You guys, do the, the, the you guys' voice bother? Does his bother you, or vice versa? Same. Do, do you ever ask yourself what is going on? How come my voice bothers me, his voice doesn't bother me? And they're both recorded, right? So let's break this down. You have what you're saying is that you have you you have one voice recording. Ushi sounds the same on both, right? You sound the same for Ushi's ears, but in your own head, you How have about two... when I make a recording, I listen to mine, it sounds horrible. Menachem listens to it, it's totally fine. Same so, so in other words, your voice live and your voice recorded are two different versions. Is that accurate? Yes, it is. And you're telling me you like your live version better. Is that accurate? I don't what? think I can hear it. Other people hear or not what no, I hear. But I'm talking right now, right? When you're talking right now, you guys like that version better, right? Sounds good. Yeah, so you ever ask yourself, What's going on? So we have something called output and input. Output is how we talk. Input is how we listen. So when you're listening to a voice recording from an outsider, let's say an Achim, and you listen to an Achim live, there's no difference because you're just passive. But when you're listening to yourself, you're actually not passive when it's live. You're actually in your head. You're hearing vibrations of your throat, of your ears. It's live. So you have these echoes in your head. And that's why when you're live, it sounds different than when you're recording. So in other words, it explains why there's two versions, right? So let me ask you guys, what do you think the whole world hears? What you hear live or recorded? The question. The whole world hears recorded. When I speak live, they hear what I hear. But that's the recorded version. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, what you're saying is you use logical deduction. You can rule out the fact that I have this louder thing in my head echoing. It must be that my loud voice isn't real. So the question is, but that's the one you like better. How could that make any sense? How come you like your fake voice better if your real voice is the recorded voice? Because since your attachment started earlier on, you didn't have the chachma and you got used to unhealthy fakeness. You decided that's what you are. If you remember the first time you heard that voice recorded, you're like, darn it. No one better have heard that one. Because you were, you were wondering what was going on. Yeah, that's what happens. But over time, you start to accept the reality. It's uncomfortable. I'm not going to think about it. I'll put it in the back. I'll make believe no one knows. Until you start realizing everyone's in the same boat. So you get comfortably uncomfortable. But the facts are, you really sound like a recorded version. And the reason why you're stuck in that script is because you were introduced to it at a young age. And you didn't have the ability. And you became biased and con connected into falsehood. But the cool thing is, like you were saying, Yoshi, that... People who are celebrities actually work through this lie through psychotherapy, awareness, and updating the scripts. So they no longer live in the old, the old scripts. And over time, they don't care about their voice. They're okay with the recorded or the live version through awareness, understanding, and working through it in the here and now. So now I might start making more recordings. You fully know you'll become a singer after this. Amazing. Um, how about looking in the mirror? It's the same thing. And tickling is the same thing. You could be as ticklish as you want, but you can't tickle yourself. And that's really where it's in, it itself comes in. Ultimately, when you finally understand who you are and you work through and you have this healthy awareness, you're able to actually update scripts through real-time relationships. You can start off through individual therapy, but ultimately, without externalizing it through relationships and external behaviors, you're going to still have limitations within the therapeutic interventions you get and the understandings you have. So how do we update our our program? How do we actually we you know we don't like the recordings, we don't like the 
the mirror, what we see in the mirror, we just not comfortable with what we see, what we hear. How do we update that? So the first thing is to be aware. The first stage is opening up that awareness. Wow. Interesting. So you tell me my voice that I think is real is really fake, and the one that's fake is really real? Interesting. So listen to a couple of recordings. See what comes up for you. Wow. My, 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 my heart rate's going up. My stomach's churning. I'm getting all self-conscious. I'm avoiding it. This goes back to the three stages of change. Okay. So sit there a second and say, hold on. That's interesting. Okay, it's okay to avoid it. Let's be curious about it. Start seeing what's going on in your body. What well, feelings are coming up. Because what really happened in your younger years, you disconnected. You disassociated. And most, while most people are trying to get the connection, most of the ways they do is deal with the symptoms of the heart rate, uncomfortabilities, and they try to shut it down. But the problem is that experience is the foundation of change. And when you disconnect to that foundation, you shut down the symptoms, by default, you're shafting yourself because you have no way to ever heal or update the script. It's like never listen to recording. You're right, you're comfortable, but you're also unaware. And you'll be controlled the rest of your life by your past scripts and life experiences for the rest of your lifetime. So the first stage is getting aware that there are outdated scripts, understanding them. And as you understand them, working through them with different interventions. Mm-hmm. So let's go to another. Let's go to another question. I'm very successful. And I do a lot of traveling for business. I know it's not the best situation for my marriage and for my family, but it's the right thing for Parnosa. How do I know if I'm running away from myself or I'm doing the right thing? So basically, in short, you know, talk to the guys that are going and coming and stuff, but they're making money. They they obviously have things to do. How do they know if they're actually running away from themselves and who they are because they're just not comfortable with themselves? Or, you know, you, you're supposed to do this. You're supposed to run and, you know. How does person, how how the person value it? Like, it's, it's a hard question because you can't use a specific case, but how do you value that? That's, that's a great question. It, it's funny because the question itself is is the value. See, if the, the fact that it's coming here and he's asking the question, he doesn't feel comfortable about it because he felt comfortable about it. He would never brought up. He wouldn't have brought it, sat there in the first place. So when you're breaking down that, that feeling in itself, Interesting. So what made you ask that question? Are you abandoning yourself, your wife, your kids? Otherwise, I know I'm, I always tell my clients, I say, if you could pick an animal, to be any animal, what animal would it be? So they go, Aaron, Ari, what would you pick? I said, a bird lion. They're like, huh, that's not an animal. I said, it's my imagination. I can do whatever I want. I said, I want to be a fierce bird. So no one can eat me and just take, I want to be the king of the birds. I can fly anywhere. I can fly to Israel. I can be the most fierce. And the facts are, I have no stress when I wake up in the morning, like, darn it, why am I not a bird line this morning? You know why? Because I don't have uncomfortability not being that. I don't send a question to, to, to Menachem and Ushi to, hey, why can I be a coach? Why can I be a bird line today? Because, I mean, it's a fantasy of mine. It's pretty cool. But it's not something that I hold, in the, in, like, hold against myself. So the fact that he's sending in the question already, it's, we, have a, we have a snapshot into it. But I would challenge this individual to start going into what that uncomfortability is. And instead of disassociating by running away, while he's running away one time and he has the piece of quiet because he is traveling, delve into that a little bit. Be curious. Mm, not might not be easy. And if he's traveling, he wants to. But you're saying, right, you can people can go on vacation and spend time. It looks like they're spending time with themselves, but they come back and they haven't thought about it. So it's a good idea. So here's a question somebody sent in. Somebody looks like he is in rehab. How do I heal myself? I'm in a recovery program. It's, they are doing amazing work. It is doing amazing work, but it's very hard to believe I'll ever be okay with myself. What would you answer somebody raw? Somebody, what's my next step? So I, I, they, it's really it's a difficult question to answer without having more information because in the beginning stages, there's a lot of uncomfortability going on because the, the sobriety is taking away the pacifier. He is uncomfortable with himself. He's got a lot of uncomfortability going on internally currently as we speak. And the thing that he was doing was a genius idea at the time when he started it. Whenever his addiction started, whether it was a teenage years or wherever the onset was, he didn't have the chachla. He was shutting off the recording because he couldn't listen to it. It was uncomfortable. So he came with a great way to shut down that recording. Substance use. It's a, again with the limited capacities. It's a genius, dumb, unhealthy intervention, but it's a genius in the sense of way it worked. It really worked well. Today we pulled away the pacifier. The outcome is pain. 
So the fact that he's feeling pain, his body's telling him truth. How to navigate that is a tricky answer. And that's hard to answer without understanding all the details in the equation. But the fact that he's feeling it isn't inappropriate. So the first the first step, if you're feeling, you don't see the light in the tunnel, you don't see how this is going to help, you don't see how, all these questions, when they come up, get the support you need. Because it's part of the process. So for that, I would tell him to start realizing, start thinking about what does it mean, this pain? What, what, what exactly is uncomfortable without the drug? What did the drug do for him? When he used it, what were the times he was using it versus not using it? Was, was there a couple of events that led up to his usage? Does he remember the first time he used it? What was the goal of that first usage? That will be identity. Mm -hmm. I want to go back a step. I don't know if we covered it or not, but I think it's an important step. How does, the question is like this. It's a good question, that's why I'm reading it. How does negative sense of identity, somebody you know views themselves in a bad way, how does that turn into addiction? Like, how does that play out? So when, when you feel uncomfortable in your skin and you really feel, for example, let's have a stomach ache, right? And I mean, how often do you have a stomach ache? An example that I know a lot of guys have. A, a lot of guys go to shul. A lot of guys, when they go to shul, they feel very uncomfortable in shul, whether they don't want to dive in for the Ahmed or they don't want to get an aliyah or they don't feel comfortable in shul, they go drink. I think that's, that's something, something to do with identity. I don't know. What's your opinion on that? Okay, so I feel you like want... I feel the drinking level is so, so like abnormal, like it's so like you could see it so clearly. So, you know what I mean? What's your opinion on that? So, so breaking down a drinking in shul. So you're saying the guy comes to shul and he feels uncomfortable. Sounds like it will be a social it's exhaustion. Social, I don't know, something's causing it. Yeah. So, 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 so what, what's social anxiety? I'm, uh, I'm going to look at someone. He, he, he's, he's making me feel uncomfortable. That's definitely at the heart of that. It's identity. What makes me uncomfortable at shul with other people around? Is it because the, they dress nicer than me? The better daveners than me? They're wealthier than me? They have uh, nicer children, a more beautiful spouse. They, I, and there's a million things that can make someone uncomfortable with who they are. So the question is, what's coming up for them, and what is exactly plaguing them internally? Most people rather not have that. They rather say, "Hey, I'm so used to blocking out my entire experience. Let me drink." The, the issue is, is that. When you shut yourself down long term, they wrote pressure to perform. A pressure to perform. That's another one. Perform what? Anything, whatever. You're a bunch of people there. They're all doing certain things. You're spending money or talking a certain way, things you don't understand. So, you know. So, it sounds like so, the that, so that's basically what you're saying when they feel a loss of identity. I'm just using one example, there's hundreds of examples. They turn that into some type of addiction, and then the addiction sort of takes a life on its yeah. own. So, so that's a perfect example. Um, a person has a you identity, more or less, when they, when they start malfunctioning because they start kicking on outside during the stage of core belief structure from 6 to 12 or 14, typically. When you're having it, wow, Yossi, that was so amazing. You did that picture versus, yeah, very cool. Yeah, and walks away. And constantly does a reinforcer for years and years and years. This kid, Yossi, who's 6 to 12 years old, stops believing that he has any value because dad never showed me attention because he comes home at 6.30 after an eight and a half, nine hour work day, sitting on the train. And now he's got to run to second Seder or learn a little bit of his so run to Menchem Meyer, quickly clean up after the kitchen if they have cleaning help. In other words, he's not necessarily a hachas, but he's getting this kid to not believe he has any value or core belief that anything's worthy. So what this kid does, he starts doing crazier things to get more attention. And eventually he starts hitting the identity development and he starts having an outside in identity. That same person will overly drink. You know why? Because he's stimulated by outside in versus inside out. So the first stage is start being aware of, wow, I am not who I am. I'm everyone else. Okay, taking... Let's pause here for a second. Let's use a woman example also. Like, give me a few woman examples that would be similar to that. Shopping, dressing. I'll give me like a few examples. Shopping, dressing, body images. I know, I, I, like I said, I primarily focus on men, so I have men examples typically in my head, but I could pull stuff out. You know, um, uh, social media uh, is, a, is a big thing. They're putting, posting a picture of their kids and family wearing the new styles, it's the old stuff. You saw that kid he was wearing last year's shoot. They probably got it on clearance. You know, again, what is the difference? And what is allowing you to even to have that experience to be so stuck up on, wow, I, I, I don't know what to do. That, that, it's because the foundation isn't the shoes. It's the drug. The foundation is the inability to feel comfortable within your skin. And odds are, if you track this attachment, it's a very insecure attachment. There's not a lot of safety in this individual's house. I wouldn't be surprised if that same wife's 
husband is the one who travels. So again, so to recap, the person has an identity issue. They use some form of addiction to subsidize that, those feelings and to cope with it. And then the addiction sort of goes on its own. Then they, and so now when you're going for treatment for addiction, you're going to a rehab, you're going to deal a therapist addiction. So they're focusing on the external symptoms. So typically going back and we start off today again. So what happens is when a person comes to an addiction rehab center, which I worked in for four to six years before opening my private practice, they end up coming there and said, my, I'm, I'm, I'm yelling at my wife. I'm constantly using drugs. Every time I do this, I, I can't go anywhere. I'm so socially anxious. I, I got to get rid of all this stuff. And they're not wrong, but they're off mark. And because they're in my office, usually with the, per the reason why someone comes to my office is out of the way within a, within a month to two months. And we're dealing with core stuff. I had a client recently, but recently, pretty wild. who came to me for, uh, for a gambling addiction. This individual within four sessions was not an addict of gambling, not at all. We're dealing with identity. And it turned out this person was abused in a very unhealthy way at a young age. And the one of the ways they were able to numb themselves was high stakes gambling and distracting through the gambling addiction. Turns out within 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 two months, the person wasn't on at all, at all with, with gambling at all. That wasn't even our topic. Our topic was the ability to hold space for yourself while navigating other people hacking your system. Today he's functioning very different than he was in the beginning. I want to push back on you a little bit. So people that like they put alcohol near them and they just can't control themselves. But if that's really the tiktsa, that's because they had an identity issue because they couldn't come to shul deal with people. Why that need for that drug or that alcohol is so powerful that it overtakes them? Is it because they trained it? Like what? You know what I'm saying? So to throw us out. What you're saying is 100% authentic, 100% true. Then it should be very simple. It's not really I like the alcohol. Like I don't like the alcohol. I'm just trying to cope with it. But but they, they, they can't, they, they, you know, so explain that. Very good question. So to answer, one thing you got to look at is people who go to rehab and completely sober up and, and have the complete healing, yet six months later, they don't have that biological need for it, still fall back to that same experience, which throws us off. Hold on. What allows me to fall back to that biological experience if I already broke it? And there's nothing that could be pulling me biologically, but yet I'm still going back to that same experience. In other words, it's not necessarily the biological experience. It's the void and the uncomfortability that gets them to drink. Most of the people I work with who have similarities to that, when they finally work through their own selves and have comfortability, they don't necessarily need that drink when they have it or not. And they won't necessarily be pulled to drink when the drinks are happening around them. If they have one drink when they're finally healed, they don't necessarily drink the whole bottle. You're talking about somebody who has been dealing with many years of struggling with identity, or attachment, not having the healthy attachment. How do you do that in four sessions? It's not necessarily in four sessions. In four sessions, they start to realize that their issues aren't about their issues. It's about the lack of connection to themselves. The, the evolution and process of identity is constantly evolving because even the healthy individual is constantly changing. If you're the same person within your identity that you were 18 at 25 and at 40, we would be very simple people with not a lot of accomplishments in life, which adds on to the back of the point where the guys brought up earlier. What about the healthy individual? Most people are healthy individuals after a certain point of therapy, and they still could use therapy because they can't tickle themselves. Therapy isn't for people who have issues per se. Yes, that's the one that gives us bad rep. And people, oh, you're an therapist. Sadly, therapists should be for everyone to a certain extent at different points of their life to recalibrate. If I asked you, hey, you did an oil change, you went for your tire, um, tire, tire, tire recalibration? Yeah, you must be a really bad driver. No, Ari, I just drove a lot of miles the last six months. Exactly. You're not a bad driver because you're weird and terrible. Your car happens. You're a human being. Yeah, there are people who have issues. But a substantial amount of people who don't have issues could still use an outsider, a safe space to explore and get tickled in ways they never knew they were ticklish so they could protect themselves in the real world of things. That's an important concept. It's very hard for a person. I think this, the saying is, Ein chavish mata atzmoi. A person to get him to perform, to do to the next level, to update. Sometimes it's hard for you to see yourself. And if you have a friend, whether it's somebody, you know, somebody out there who can ask you the right questions, and you're like, you're right. Why didn't I do it? And it takes you to the next level. It's cool. actually a mission in Pirkei Ovos just pops to mind. I talk to my clients from time to time. That's not stupid. Pay for friendship. 
I mean, I don't want to be friends with you if you pay me, right? What does it mean, Kneel Chachab? From my standpoint, that's a clinical relationship. I'm closer and, and deeper connection with many of my clients that they don't have in the rest of their lives. It's, they say it to me all the time, you're closer to me than my dad, my family members, everyone for that sake. But yet, how does that work? Wow. In other words, they pay for a friendship to be able to have a healthy container to reprocess themselves. Let me unmute you. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I got you, Aaron. Hold on. Sorry, hit the wrong button. All right. Okay, okay let's, let's go into this next question because I, I know we touched on it, but I think it's a very clear question that's really going to bring out a point. Somebody wrote, there's something I've been struggling with all my years. I'm learning in Koyal and Baruch Hashem, Matzliach, but there's something, some kind of feeling of emptiness. I can't pinpoint what it is. It might be my identity. And if, and if what my identity is, how do I def Basically, like he feels like he doesn't know what's wrong. He just feels empty inside. He maybe, you know, he's not clarifying what the identity issue is. But so basically, in short, what is an identity and how do I define it? Let's just go back to the alphabet of identity. Okay. So again, I apologize, guys. I wasn't planning to use my phone. And my phone is beginning to die. So I just got to get it. Charged. Okay, thank you, Tom. Well, we, we did it all tonight. Here we go. Hold on. Beautiful. Let's make sure it's charging. Okay, here we go. So very good question. That, that's an amazing question. Just a majority of my clientele are ones with who are active problems. See, I get a, about the 20%. The most of them are regular run-of-the-mill yeshiva guys, actually from the tri-state and Lakewood area, who have a similar experience to what you're describing. I'm doing everything perfectly fine in my life. Why do I feel uncomfortable still from time to time? And that goes back to the recording concept. A person who doesn't know that the recording of their voice and recording isn't necessarily not them. It's just that they didn't have an understanding. They're going to constantly live in like, oh my gosh, I'm a weirdo and I don't want anyone knowing that I'm a weirdo because and that's I, I, that's why it goes back to what you're saying, Menachem. You tell me you heal. It's not that I'm healing. These people are healed. They're normal individuals. They're just they're just so self-conscious and scared to open up the can of worms. So let's make it. Anyone knew what I was really doing with this recording? They'll think I'm crazy. And that there's a hundreds of these experiences called cognitive distortions that don't allow people to get needed help. And then they end up turning to drugs for no reason. They, they numb themselves. They think they're really... So I've had some successful cases really, really quick that make no sense. But it wasn't that it makes no sense. The person was never an addict. They were using drugs for eight years, ten years of their life, drinking like a mishugana. But the person was not an alcoholic. They just listened to the recording wrong. The second the recording was right, they're like, I have a shot. I don't, it's irrelevant. Okay, I'm going to say it and I moved on. And that's the problem with a lot of people I notice that do go to systems that do get help very much, but still don't feel good because they don't need that approach. It's like driving in a car with elbow pads, knee pads, and a helmet. And it's a great idea because there are car accidents. You could bend your knees, you could bend your head, and you hurt your elbows. But is it really necessary if you have a seatbelt? You need to wear a mask when you drive. I mean, it's again, it can, some people, yes. If you're in a car accident, maybe you have bad elbows, you want knee pads, like, hey, here, why you can do it, you'll be okay with it. But a lot of these individuals were never an addict in the first place. But because a lot of the treatments are just geared towards certain experience and dealing with the symptoms, it misses the boat. Especially with a lot of yeshiva guy background, who most of them have an identity of uncomfortability for a number of different reasons, depending on the case we're dealing with. And this is the cola guy specifically. Uh, is a big, a lot of times, cola individuals, have, not that they don't want to learn Torah all day, but they don't necessarily want to sit in cola. I mean, are you day. saying a very strong comment, basically, somebody who has a very healthy sense of self and identity, the chance of him coming an addict is so low. Is that is that what you're basically saying? At least from my experience. So I've, I've been getting a lot of cases. And because of my atypical approach, I end up getting a lot of outliers, at least from the typical referral sources, that don't come word over mouth from my original clients. So from relief in these other type of facilities, um, of re re um, referral sources, they are, they're, they're sending me a lot of individuals, what we call the outliers. And these people have been in between 15 to 30 therapists, spend a quarter million dollars in therapy. And, I work with them for a few months and we start recalibrating really quick. And they ask me, all right, what's going on here? I said, I don't know. They call them client resistant. They're not, there's, there's not treatment resistant clients. There's therapist resistant clients. And they have to have the right therapist and connection to change. This is one of the reasons why next, this, this coming up to, up Tuesday, I'm starting a new group here in South Florida, which is an oasis you guys have in Lakewood with a guy named Shirley Fast. We're opening up these groups down here that are identity based versus 12 step based. Not that they don't work, but the majority of these individuals are in SA or these other groups are necessarily addicts, which is why a lot of these people keep going back for a long period of time, hoping it will work for them. 
I don't think it's ever going to work for them because you're taking the wrong treatment for the individual that's not necessarily appropriate. They're not addicts. They have identity problems. But because of the culture in the world today, when you say the word identity, people get triggered in a funny way. This is, gonna, this is like taking a twist on it a little bit. And, I, and so I'm, I'm, I'm going to really bring in this point. My 13-year-old son, I'm noticing some addictive behaviors. Like he gets very angry if he wants something. Is there anything we could do when they're young to prevent it? I, I want to bring up another thing and throw it on top of it. I'm sorry for doing this. But like you see a lot of times these young kids, they have... But they're there by the Kadeshim and they're drinking the mashka and they like get into drinking or they get into the smoking or the vaping. It's see, I'm telling you my point of view, I could be totally wrong. I'm sure in Florida you don't have this, but it seems like the younger, the youth, the youth, or whatever Kalish calls them, the youngsters, they the you know, we, we could say people have addictive personalities, which I think there is a concept like that. Some people just by DNA are a little bit more addictive personality. There is that concept. Um but hypersensitive, just, it's called hypersensitive individuals. There are a group of about 20 to 25 percent of individuals. There's a whole book on this idea of hypersensitive people. Hypersensitive people are more prone to using 100 percent, but it's not because of addiction. That's again going back to, to the DSM or the symptom management perspective. It's because, all about the original concept. You're just saying that they're, they're, for them, it's, they're, they're going to get addicted much quicker. They're, they're, so, they're, so, again, when you see a young child, and let's assume everything is okay ish. Um, how do you first of all curve the addictive personality, whether it's drinking or the vaping or the smoke, whatever they're, whatever the addictive, it doesn't make good it is. And also like, I, I, my question is, why do we see so many younger children getting into addictive type of behaviors? Hypersensitivity breeds hypersensitivity. Hypersensitive parents will have hypersensitive children. Hypersensitive friends will have hypersensitive. So it's sort of ex expansion. What you will notice typically is that the individual is hypersensitive, is very street smart, and tuned into everything, picks up onto a lot of different stuff. In other words, their operating system is constantly being stimulated. Do you know how agitating that is? It can be very agitating. Imagine now, pop that off with an disconnect to self because they never had the proper guidance. First, we like to say six to 12 years when they had the foundational connection to their emotions and their feelings. So they learned the, the skills they need to regulate and connect to that part of themselves. So now they lack that connection. Mixed within that equation, they're overly sensitive. They're going to have emotional outbursts. Anger isn't a problem. You know why you get angry? Anger is a response to the problem that you don't know, which is why you're getting angry. In other words, you're only okay. getting angry because you don't know what to do. Otherwise, like the parent says, hey, the kid's getting angry. Calm down. He's like, oh, I don't want to know. So Typical anger is an inability to understand what's really wrong and what's going on. And the safe zone to explore that anger, that uncomfortability in a way that you feel comfortable getting vulnerable, looking through that lenses. So yes, alcohol, drugs, or vaping is a good way to shut down. Vaping, for example, is smoking. You have a connection to crew and you feel connected safe you know what because your friends are doing it you know like, yeah dad and mom you think you're cool i got my crew and i feel secure and i don't care what you're going to say if you try to come up to me, i don't yell and scream at you and i got my guys to back me up i'm safe i'm secure drugs alcohol numb it, and you feel safe and secure even though you're not yourself if you actually analyze any of these interventions 99 percent they're creating a window of safety and comfortability and pacify with smoke and by the way just attack the child typically you'll end up actually exasperating the pain of insecurity and it'll heighten the use of security. In this case, unhealthy security. Because ultimately, healthy security allows them to regulate, connect, and change their behavior. So how do we try to help that when we start seeing small signs of this? So depending on the, the client, that's why it's, in, in, this, in this presentation, it's really hard without real-time data in the case because the details of the case matter. So if we're dealing with a teenager will be or a younger teenager will be one thing because it's like hey the, the guy the guy has cancer okay but once the cancer is there it's really hard to deal with it you might have to do an amputation but if the person just only smoking two pa a pack a day and he's only twelve it's a different intervention than when the person forty five has been smoking for twenty two years so although we're giving an overall presentation to these experiences each case will have a different intervention but the same equation will always exist the idea is to help him to have a healthy identity yeah the first key is safety what i establish in my therapy practice which is different than other people is i'm not a big i do that i'll do an intake of biological psychosocial it's called a biopsychosocial a biological psychological social background which will go through everything that happens from they were born to the best they remember to where they're in my office after we do that we do a problem and a goal what's the problem the goal it's focusing sort of like in the highway you have the bumpy and the bumpy you know where you're going. Now we have a, a perspective. Odds are anything that has happened to them in their entire life 
will happen within that window. The example I give is uh, this new couple, newly wedded couple gets married. They're looking out the window. The husband turns to the wife and he says, hey, honey, you see your neighbors across the street. Look at them. The sheets, they're hanging there. It's all dirty. I feel like one of us should go there, maybe help them with the laundry. It's just, I feel bad. They're, they don't know what they're doing. The wife's like, hey, honey, that's, that's just socially inappropriate. We're not going to do that. Anyways, two weeks pass. The husband and wife are sitting for breakfast again. They're looking at the same, the same window and they see the sheets out there and they're spotless. And the husband turns to the wife, honey, how do they clean those sheets? Did you go there and teach them? She goes, no, I just washed our windows last week. Ultimately, when you when we see these lenses every week and we know the biopsychosocial history within what's triggering them, we actually bring the traumas that are here and now, the neglects that are here and now, and through relational experiencing, we're able to update just like the voice recording. Now, I'm willing to bet it. I know that my clients have. They say, Ari, as I listen to those recordings, I keep in mind what you told me. I have less triggers listening to the recording. In other words, with the right understanding and the right safety bubble to explore over time, the original event that is triggering you diminishes over time. What is it? What should I keep in mind? Uh, for, the, for the record, I mean, the recording itself, when you're listening to you understand, and you stop. Then the, the Rashi Pebe said, get the stop, rain, stop. Take a look around what's going on. Oh, observe internally and externally what's happening. P, proceed with caution. How do you proceed? With rain. Realize what you just saw on that stop. Allow your feelings to come forth and be curious about them. Oh, I investigate them. And let's sit with that. Over time, that connection doesn't need a, a solution. You have that solution. You just never had the safety to explore it. Wow, stop rain. Okay, here's a question that came in. My husband is a very structured guy. I'm wondering if being addicted to a certain schedule, showing up at the same time, the same chakras every single day, would that be considered an addiction? Because he can't let he let go. When things come up, he just can't let go. Is that considered an addiction? It's, and again, this goes back to what we were saying earlier, whether functionality and ability to, to, to function in a life. So I do have a case I worked in the past similar to that. And the, the issue was the husband, a great individual, a balanced individual, but like I told the husband, I'm like, hey, you're not living in an island. You have a wife and you have a bunch of children. And they don't feel like you're ever around for them. And now some of the kids were acting out for attention, feeling, feeling as if they don't exist and having this almost invisibility towards who they are. Constantly feeling uncomfortable, turning to unhealthy behaviors, either for attention or to numb the pain. So the answer to that is it's all relative if the person is okay or not. But if they're bringing up the question and the wife and their life is giving them the signs that stuff aren't working for them, then it's important for them to explore what that's really about and start working through that experience. Just one example, the Rav who was intervening said, hey, maybe stop learning muster and learn Hasidus. Or stop davening 7.30, I want to daven to 7.45. Let's well, again, he, he didn't say that. He said, start learning, stop learning muster uh, and learn Hasidus because by default, that's attack, that, that's an identity. That's, that's a, the, the Rav is on a mission. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's a little talk about <laughs> but I'm just saying, ask the guy, you know, one day down at eight o'clock, let's see what happens. He says, oh, I can't, I can't. Well, what's going on? What the, what, the, what the reason, what's going on and how the family's missing, understand what comes up for me in those moments. Odds are there's usually a microcosm of their upbringing. And if, I wouldn't be surprised if you see this pattern throughout their life. And it's usually a security or safety need for having a schedule oriented. Even though today it's not really safety for them because their kids are malfunctioning, their family dynamics aren't working. So they're just stuck in old scripts. They still have that bubble on the iPhone. They're not doing that. I do find a lot of people, they start going for healing. And then the people around them complain that it looks like they're letting go and uh, and uh, and he's getting worse. You know, it was better when he had a structure. So the idea of sometimes it's part of healing. Let him figure things out. Let him see what it feels like. He might like it, might not. And... Let's see where this goes. It might take time, but be there. Don't lose it. Don't, you know, you read the Latara Chalia. So that's one, the Sheva Yipal Tzadik, but more important is the concept of the Tara Tinuk Shanishbar. What's a Tinuk Shanishbar? A Tinuk Shanishbar is an adult who's Chayev, Onesh, Scharan, Onesh, but it's not Chayev, Scharan, Onesh. You know why? Because they don't have Chayev. Why don't they have Chayev? Because they didn't grow up in a social cultural structure to know that film was even necessary. They were conservative or reformed. So now they struggle with certain behaviors. Even though they're 25, 30, 
halachically, they're not held accountable for a lot of the stuff they're doing because they're a tin of shnishpah. How does that work with emotional disconnection for an adult who grew up FFB from, from birth, but yet never was really authentically connected to their tfilos or to their behaviors or to the religion? And now they finally have an identity crisis and a crushing uh, a realization in therapy, and they realize, I am everyone else, not myself. How do we reintegrate this person into religion and spirituality in a balanced and a healthy manner? This is something I hack out with a lot of Rabbanan because it's a very complicating case. Wow. Okay. Let's go to this question. Hi, I'm here. Hi. Good evening. Thank you so much for the time today. My question is uh, in response to a number of violent uh, interactions that I've survived on the subway. I was attacked last year on the subway and had my nose broken. And this a uh, couple of weeks ago, I was followed in the subway cars and I was spat upon and been a number of violent things that I've been observing in New York City and in New Jersey around me. And I'm starting to have I noticing this belief setting in that in general I'm somehow unsafe and that I'm targeted and I believe this is a false belief because I know inherently Hashem is with me and I am safe but I would like you to please suggest some in the moment while the thing happening responses and then maybe a daily practice or something I can introduce to counterbalance these uh, distressing experiences and thoughts. So, Aaron, it's basically like like messing with her identity of safety. Her identity. But, but, but it's a very important first for starters to acknowledge that, that that's the ongoing fear that's still existent currently. So, like, first, I, I'm sorry you've gone through that. That's that's it's crazy. I I, I I I can't imagine what that what you've gone through. It's it's unbelievably it's it's, it's mind boggling. But the problem is the current with the world we live in with the anti-Semitism that stuff are going on. There's still an active fear that has some validity to it. So it's a catch-22 in a scenario. You're not necessarily being paranoid. And there is a point of self-protection that we have to do our shabbos. So it's not like you're, hey, you're, 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 the world has changed. You're living peaceful in a kibbutz, if it's a peaceful place. And you have security. You don't. You're still going to be going to these places that don't have that. So there's not just an irrational fear here. There's actually a rational fear that needs some protection. So there are certain coping skills you can do, but the fact that you're still with abuse or the possibility for that abuse to happen, it's a tricky situation. The uh, I've sought, I'm sorry. I've it, sought counsel from law enforcement and I've gone to community groups and I've sought ways to connect with other people who have survived uh, assaults and situations like that. And I really haven't found, I think that those environments are more unhealthy and perpetuate the false beliefs rather than, and it's better to put myself in more normalized situations, sit next to the conductor in the vehicle, but not necessarily put myself in a bubble. Yeah, that's more or less what I was getting at, yes. Because what you're describing isn't a scenario that's irrational. Yes, there are factors that are playing a role and probably exasperating the pain of fears based on emotions and uh, uncomfortability, the 100%. And, but the fear of the identity is a valid fear. So there are simple interventions, but ultimately, maybe a self-defense course, I don't know if you're comfortable carrying a weapon, but there are certain things that could play a role to give you that safety and, and even bringing a higher power Hashem into it. But practically... There are there are things that can happen in the world we live in, especially the climate we have. So it's not like something that you'll be able to uproot, at least from my experience working with this, when the active scenario is still going on. It also brings up the idea of when somebody is in in an a situation of abuse, you know, you're not going to tell them to go, you know, to work on it. Well, many times they have to disconnect or leave the situation. Yes. Yes, and that's that. That's what I was thinking about. The same thing is in, in an active case of abuse, and someone's still being abused by someone in, that, that they're married to, or parent, or sibling, or or a predator. You have no choice, but sometimes the, there there are bad situations that you're in, and they're just uncomfortable situations. Psychotherapy can't necessarily help active scenarios that are going down as they're going down. They can help you deal with certain coping skills emotionally, internally, and maybe give you the self esteem and confidence to stand up to the abusive situation. But ultimately, there are times when you have to figure out how to cut ties with those patterns. And if it's maybe figuring out a different route instead of a train 
or a different job. Those are definitely interventions we could discuss if I'll be working with such a case. Aaron, let's go to this question. It's the million dollar question of the night. You ready? I grew up in a home where there's a lot of dysfunction. I learned to cope by disassociating. I've been in therapy for many years now, but is it really possible to heal from that? I always feel like I'm not grounding. How do I heal? So let's just take the question and clarify a little more. Somebody who has a bad sense of self, bad sense of identity, whatever words you want to use, and is working on themselves, can they ever really get a new sense of identity where, again, let's let's go back a little bit. We were saying in the beginning that 6 to 12 is when your core beliefs is built, I guess, in what you believe in and also your identity, correct? Yeah. If those years were very damaged or you were brought up in an environment where you were abused or people put you down or you believed you were a bad person. Now they're 30 years old and, you know, they're working through it. They're in therapy. They realized, you know, that this is what happened. Can they really ever get a healthy sense of self and identity so they could live a non-addictive <laughs> or a healthier life? So this is the million dollar question. Amazing question. I, I, this question is asked me very often because that's why a lot of people are coming to me. Um, that's the whole point of therapy. And that's one of the biggest things we're going to accomplish through therapy. The, the issue is, is that individual therapy in itself and doing past trauma or neglect therapy is going to be a little limited in, in the scope to be able to change that. The only way to really heal that will be through relational experiences. Because going back to a point you made earlier on tonight, relational healing or relational trauma or neglects have to be healed through relational experiences. In other words, through triggering events and through connections. And if your family aren't those the ones that you can heal it to, then you'll have to find those who you can. Sometimes that's through the therapeutic alliance and the connection to the therapist to start that experience. And then it's taking it to other types of relationships. But there are many families that I've seen that don't have healthy dynamics. And the only way to get healthier is by having relationships with people who are healthier and healing yourself. So yes, that is possible, but it wouldn't necessarily happen through individual therapy. And I've seen this because trauma therapy focus in the past will be such a case. Most individuals who go for trauma therapy in the past not necessarily is bringing the scripts that they hear and now and updating them. So although they may be understanding and working through them in the past, in the here and now, they never get those updates. So they're going to end up having the same neglects or traumas through relationships and still shut down and still be in shul and have those social anxiety, even though they know that their father ignored them or that they were so on and so forth. Here's an interesting question. And let's see how we can cover a little bit of the idea. You mentioned before that you do um, administer some uh, psychedelics. So the question that came in is, isn't psychedelic just another form of a drug? And this is something that somebody has been in addiction treatment. Why is that? Why is it different when we're talking about drugs? Some are addicted to drugs. And here we are with psychedelics and that can heal. How do we understand the difference? That's an amazing, amazing question. A lot of people call me about this. Say. So for starters, I want to clarify, not, I don't administer psychedelics. It's a, it's a, it's a different uh, way it's being done because uh, currently there's only one form of psychedelic that it's legally recognized called ketamine. And that's not even a psychedelic. It's an anesthetic. It's being used in an off-label experience. And actually from the psychedelic family, that's not even considered a psychedelic. So it's a different question to go on how the psychedelics are, are being introduced. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that later on. Um, but in the case when a, in the person ingests a psychedelic, the, the difference between a psychedelic and a psychiatric is, is a very, very important question to clarify here. So we touched upon it a little bit in the beginning of the introduction. I'm not sure if anyone heard it, but a lot of it was really a regular acha. So we'll go a little bit more. Again. Excuse me? It's always good to hear it again. Yeah, and again, it was, wasn't, it was muffled. And I, I didn't really jump into the details of it. I wasn't sure whether we wanted to talk about it or get into it. So we could talk about it a little bit now. Psychiatry, going back to the emotional pain, psychiatry is either a, an antagonist, either shuts down or hyper makes the mind more active. But the goal is really to regulate the emotional experience and typically numb it out. So you give the opportunity for a person to change the behaviors or unhealthy patterns. The issue is that when you take away the emotional pain or the uncomfortability, the need to change disappears because the motivating factor of why you change is because you feel uncomfortable. So what ends up happening is many individuals stop the therapy or think they're healed or don't do the work they need because the focus of the work is lost because emotional triggering or uncomfortability is gone. Psychedelics as opposed to psychiatrics are actually the opposite. It opens you up. So what is anxiety or depression? Anxiety 
is the future fear. Living so much in the future, bringing it to the here and now, you get stuck because you can't really change what might happen or anticipation of what might happen. Depression is the past. You can't uproot the past. You can't stop, but you can't be peaceful in the here. And now the problem is you're getting stuck in the past. This is something called an, an ego death, which is the, the part, the eye of you that actually manifests this energy is diminished during a psychedelic experience. Depending on the psychedelic, there's different versions of how to diminish that experience and bring out different behaviors and emotions. But the bad trip concept is precisely the idea that all these emotional defenses that you have up are taken away and you have a snapshot into the deepest parts of who you are without any blindness, which is why sometimes people go crazy from that experience is it would be emotionally overwhelming and an inability to process it, which is why it's very important. And I tell this to many people who have gone ayahuasca and, they, and I get a lot of calls about these people. I've done 17 trips and nothing's happening because it's not about the medication or the drug that helps you. It's the pre and the post and the container we have safety that you're holding during that experiences that will allow you to use it in a healthy way. It's not the medicine that heals. It's the buildup and the post. The example I give is imagine you're walking and you're falling and your skin rips open. What's that liquid that comes out, guys? Blood. Blood. Okay, without thinking, the next question, right? You walk outside. There's a beautiful rainbow sitting out here. What's the first color you notice? Blue. Blue. Mm -hmm. What do you notice? Red. <laughs> most, most people say red or blue. I guess some people think blood is blue. Yeah. But because my pre-questions I asked you, and this is not even doing real therapy for four, five, six, maybe 10 weeks before, I dominated your prefrontal cortex with blood. And by default, the red was in your forehead. When I asked the next follow-up question, by default, you shut out the next color. That's how the trip works. When you've broken down, we do all these attachment wound healing awarenesses. And all of a sudden, we go through the trip. You go through a, 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 whole, a whole discovery of understandings that you might have never seen it. And because you're no longer fearful getting stuck in the future or the past, and you're actually seeing the traumas and neglects and pains in the here and now without any distortion, having a safe container that you've created with this therapist or this individual facilitator who you trusted and you healed through the lack of safety and trust. It's a very healing experience. And we call that the wedge. We put wedges in all over your life that at one point was a sealed door. Then you start coming off the trip and you start doing integration. That takes a couple of days to start really grounding yourself back, maybe a couple hours, depending on the individuals. And as time goes on, you all of a sudden have a triggering event from your boss. Who you always felt inferior from, but you never felt inferior from him. But you felt inferior for the years of uh, criticism you might have gotten from your upbringing, whether it's siblings, parents, rabbeim, school systems. And now you're able to see through that experience because you put a wedge in it and you broke open that sealed door that I'm less than, but you realize I'm not less than necessarily. And now with that awareness and that experience you've had, you're able to reach, transform that event and slowly but surely actually heal through relationships, which is why its concept is that you need to go through that experience in the here and now, that Shefi Yipot Tzadik, and recalibrate. Not always are you able to get it the first try, which is why Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is a yearly thing. Mm -hmm. So it's scary for people to actually see without those filters. And the issue is most people think that they want to change right away. And I, I get it. I want to do as well. But it doesn't happen. So here's where the real kicker is. What I've noticed is how do my clients hold the space while still suffering? Because that was a question I was brought up. Like, oh, okay, great. I don't have nine years to change. That's true. But as long as you have create markers and going back to the problem and goal, and you have that real boundary of the, you start seeing real changes, even with the micro changes. If those micro changes that give you the empowerment and awareness and self-esteem to continue, because self-esteem and confidence are two different versions of personal biological needs that many people don't know the difference. When I ask you about hunger or thirst, you could describe exactly when you're hungry, when you're thirsty. If I asked you, Nahum, Ushi, are you feeling depleted of, of, of self-esteem or confidence today? You probably can't answer the difference between that question yet. They both play a primary role in your daily functionality, but yet you probably deprive your self-esteem on a 24-hour and seven-day basis and barely hit upon it because you don't know even know how to fuel that part of you unless you're consciously aware of what that means. Wow. For, so for somebody that's thinking about how would one know if he should 
do the process, you know, uh, or it's too it's going to be too hard. Process of therapy. Well, no medication. Medication. That's a that's a tricky. There's a bunch of rule outs and a bunch of different um interventions depending on what's going on. But psychedelics is not a first approach. It's definitely getting a bad rep in the street these days because people say, "Hey, someone did psychedelics and they changed." Yes, but that's that's like that's not the approach. Psychedelics has to be we approach with a, a very very under, strong understanding and a build up and a right container. There are people who are doing this, and from my experience, many many irresponsible individuals are doing this. Because the medications don't heal individuals. Like I said, it's the buildup and the post. The medication is the smallest part of the experience. If you don't have the right container and the right understanding of what's going on pre and post, you're going to have limited experiences. Which is, and the best case scenario, you'll have a good trip, but nothing's going to happen. From two to three months later, you're back to regular life. The difference between doing a clinical experience than a backyard shamanic ayahuasca drink on a matcha Shabbos, which is, is an article written recently, about a kid, his father, his son, I don't remember who was going around. That person did not do anything clinically in healthy fashion. They did not do anything that I would have approved of as a clinician. And most of those people are doing such things that the best case scenario, they have a cool experience, they opened up some of their childhood wounds, and they moved on. But the fact is, what did they take away from it? If I had to guess, minimal. Because, like I said, you can't tickle yourself. Are you, so are you, are you, are you you're saying that therapeutic assisted psychedelics is the way to go? Is that what you're saying? Yes, and by the way, it doesn't mean you have to be a clinical. I just want to clarify. A clinical therapist has the training. It's not the only individual who can do this work. Many people can do this work, not just therapists. I, I happen to trust therapists who have this training. I've gone through over a year of this training. I've done over 70 therapy sessions as such with psychedelics. So I'm, I'm pretty well equipped. I know when to use which ones versus not. I have a whole standard approach how I do this. But there are people who aren't therapists who could do a really good job and have been doing this under wraps for many, many years, way longer than I have doing this. I met them, and some of them are my mentors. Amazing. Okay, um, let's go to the closing part of the segment tonight. Um, very powerful. Aaron, amazing. Okay, so all the people that have joined, um, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I'm sure this recording will be available later. Um Great to for Irish Schwartz for coming on tonight. I know he had a big day today and he was very busy with some stuff, but he made time to come on. We really appreciate it. Um, I think we really covered a topic that's very vital and important. And hopefully we can get some more clarity to it once we maybe come back again, Rev Iron, and like really delve in. I feel like identity with addiction is so intertwined, like just really understanding it. it's very, very important. Again, tonight's share is 201. Um, if anyone wants to join the WhatsApp chat, there's a WhatsApp me at 732-314-1710. Or you can go to benachemberful.com and sign up over there. For the flyers again next week, Sunday, September 15th, we're going to have world famous speaker, author David Aaron, who will be speaking on the topic The Secret Life of God, transforming our perception of the divine and rediscovering your divine identity. I'm talking about divine identity. Um, it should be a very powerful program. I don't know if anybody again listened or read about Rabbi Aaron's books, he's very, very powerful, very deep thinker. So please join us. Everything is recorded. If anybody has any questions, you can email coachmanachem at gmail.com. Tonight shares 201. If you want to listen on the phone lines, the number is 732-305-9011. And if anybody would like to be in touch with Aaron Schwartzman, he has a website. Aaron, what's the website? AaronSchwartzman.com. His name, dot com. And all the information and the contact and everything, you can reach out to him over there. Um, again, thank you to all the advertising sponsors, Lakewood Scoop, LA Nara, Five Town Central, Chayla from JCN. We're going to go to the closing segment. Uh, I'll speak first, Menachem, and then Rabbi Aaron, we'll leave it to you. Um, I think tonight's topic is very important and very vital. Um, I think we really, I said this to Mr. Schwartzman when we started the share, if anybody watched Inside Out, the movie, Inside Out 2 actually discusses exactly what he was saying, that the core beliefs that we um, believe in get molded in, you know, between the ages, you know, there's no specific number, but between the ages 7 and 13, 15, 18. And as we develop, we start believing core beliefs about ourselves. We're good, we're nice, we're smart, we're good looking, we're, we're, we're whatever it is. And you actually see it in the movie so clearly. They describe it visually. It's amazing to watch. And those those identities, what we create ourselves is what gets us, you know, as adults to function in life. And tying that into addiction is so powerful. The concept of that when you have a bad belief or something you feel you can't do and you depend on something else to tie that into that. That's where this whole addiction thing, because between you and me, I'm going to say the Jackie Mason line, right? Everybody likes potato chips. Nobody likes 
straight up whiskey. It just doesn't taste good, right? So why would somebody even try it in the beginning? It's because the social pressure, right? oh, it tastes good. So you start getting into it. It's Usually most of these addictive things don't start off actually even very good schmack. It's not like, you know, when you give a kid a Hershey Kisses or a chocolate bar, they like it naturally, right? You know, but you give a kid... This this Shabbos, my kid licked my my lechayim, and he was like, "This is disgusting." You know, <laughs> so it just proves the point that we we put ourselves in this addictive thing, and then unfortunately, it really um, takes a life on its own. And I think the the one point that that he made is just people a lot of times treat the addiction, and they're not really treating the main cause of the addiction. It's like you know, somebody has has cancer, and they start targeting all the pay, places you know the cancer is going, but they're not the the mass. They're not they're not really hitting that part. And we can't really heal that way. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. And really thank you for coming on. Coach Menachem, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And like we heard, it is a topic that's, um, you know, not easy to do in a two-hour. But um, just talking about the identity, I think many people have to stop for a minute and just ask themselves some, some questions. Where am I? Why, what am I doing? Why? And um, it might be uncomfortable, like we heard tonight. A lot of uncomfortable ideas come up, but to be able to sit with it, like take a deep breath, and what do you feel, what are you scared of, and why? Good idea to do it with somebody else, not always a good need to do it with yourself, you know, but it's time to update. Time to update. With even a healthy attachment, healthy upbringing, you know, what I did yesterday was yesterday. Today is something new. I'm getting older. What else? Where, you know, and looking back, being able to be there for yourself and saying, I, I am enough. I am okay. So that all these pressures and these thoughts can uh, slowly, we can slowly let go or first sit with it and then continue. We don't have to let that control our life. But I do know that it's not easy. And it, it does take time. And people who have gone to treatment, it's, you know, something like we heard, it could be you feel like you're falling apart before you're getting back to yourself. Like throw somebody into the ocean and they'll have to figure out how to swim. But until you figure it out, it's so hard and ich, and who likes this and all these emotions and stuff come up. We just don't like it. Let me just go back to where I was. Let me just continue the way it was. Just coloring and pre-1A, and that's it. I don't want to get out of my comfort zone. I don't want to change too hard. So, yeah, it could be hard, but we're learning how to be able to sit with it so that we should be able to continue. And most important, tefillah, siyat deshmaya. We ask Hashem, Hashem, what do you want from me? And I think it does connect, which we'll talk more next week. Our relationship with Hashem, relationship with others, relationship with myself, to trust, to be vulnerable, and it all connects. And if you're numb for Elul and you don't have that the relationships you want, and you can't connect with yourself, it's time to think for a moment, what's going on? What am I running away from? So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you again. And uh, Mitchell, we'll continue the conversation. Here, Baron. So now you're closing. But my closing would be that a lot of people lose hope when it comes to really changing the lifestyle and be able to further, whether it's addiction, whether it's thinking addictions or behavioral addiction. The word addiction typically is dominated by substance use. Uh, and my experience working in this industry is that's one of the smallest cases. Most of the addicts that I'm hearing and working with are the typical user who say that the drug abuser or the drug user. In addition to realize that when you're having a client resistant to a treatment, it's not you. That's the problem. It's a therapist that's not a shit up for you. And many times people think is this they don't work in a relationship. What I've noticed is that the key to healing isn't the te techniques, it's the relationship with the therapist. So when you have this safe container and the ability to connect, you change. So many people give up hope because they didn't have the right interventions or connections. Whether it's because they went to a facility that didn't help them the first time around, or didn't help them at all because they didn't meet their needs, or as a therapist. Don't rule out change. Rule out the person who tried to help you. Wow. Beautiful. Okay, everybody have a wonderful week. We'll see you next week. Thank you, everyone, for coming on.